Good morning. In today's headlines, indictments, abortion, and the war in Ukraine, we have takeaways from former President Trump's interview aired over the weekend. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton withstands an impeachment attempt, but some possible roadblocks remain. Ten GOP presidential hopefuls make their case to Iowa voters. How did their message land in the Keokuk state? The UAW reject the latest offer in contract negotiations with the big three car makers. Find out what they're asking for. Who can help when your building is on fire or you're in a car accident? Firefighters. But now New York's bravest are being hit with a life-threatening hazard, mental stress. We speak to the director of an organization that's coming to the rescue. Good morning, all. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. Good morning, everyone. Also for me, I'm Evelyn Lee. Today is Monday, September 18th. And you know, Evelyn, something to point out is that Trump was asked in his interview with NBC over the weekend whether he would seek a third term if he was reelected. Well, and then, of course, there is a constitution that only allows two four-year terms as president. Right, but regardless, Trump was basically saying that he doesn't need it, that he'll get it done sooner than that. Yeah. Well, we're glad you're here and joining us this morning, and we're going to unpack Trump's interview. Right. In it, former President Trump defended his decision to challenge the 2020 election results. The 2024 candidate is facing an indictment in Georgia for disputing results from that state. The former president says he weighed advice from many different people after the 2020 election, but it was ultimately his own decision to formally challenge the results. Trump talked about the indictments against him, policies like abortion in the southern border, and ending the war in Ukraine. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has some takeaways from Trump's interview. Former President Trump met with NBC's Meet the Press at his estate in New Jersey last week. The 2024 presidential candidate says although it's always time for a new generation, he doesn't think 80 is too old for the job. It's really a level of competency, not the age. A recent CNN SSRS poll found roughly three quarters of Americans surveyed were seriously concerned that President Biden's age might negatively affect his current level of physical and mental competence. The GOP frontrunner says a competency test should be required for the role. Trump, who is facing four indictments, says he's confident he'll win his cases and doesn't think about them. He says it's very unlikely he would ever pardon himself if he wins back the presidency in 2024 and that he did nothing wrong by challenging what he said was a crooked election. There's so much proof of ballot stuffing. You know, it's amazing. Right just a little while ago, in terms of the modern history, where the 51 intelligence agents said very specifically they lied. They all lied. And they said about the laptop that it was Russia disinformation. That was a lie. That had a huge impact on the election. Trump held his cards on foreign policy close to his chest regarding strategies around Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's threat to Taiwan. He says both only happened after he left office, and as president, he would end the war in Ukraine quickly with a deal fair to both sides. If I tell you exactly, I lose all my bargaining chips. I mean, you can't really say exactly what you're going to do, but I would say certain things to Putin. I would say certain things to Zelensky, both of whom I get along. When asked about abortion, Republicans said his party needs to stop pushing for bans with no exceptions if they want to win elections, and that when he becomes president, both sides will come together to agree to a number of weeks or months and put the issue to rest for the first time in 52 years. Trump says he's impartial whether it happens at the state or federal level. The 2024 hopeful said no when asked if there is any way he would attempt to get a third term should he win back the White House next year. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Trump's lawyers in uh, the January 6th case filed a new motion yesterday to get federal judge Tanya Chutkin to recuse herself. Trump's legal team previously argued Chutkin should step down, but are now using the judge's own words against her in their latest court filing. Chutkin used the phrase, presidents are not kings, when denying a Trump bid to keep House investigators from his presidential records. She's overseen a number of January 6th cases and condemned defendants' actions. Chutkin will ultimately make the decision on whether to recuse herself or not. While that's unlikely to happen, Trump could use the filings in appeals if convicted. And a federal judge in the Georgia election case will hear arguments from former Justice Department official Jeffrey Clark today. Clark is one of five defendants asking to move his case to federal court. U.S. District Judge Steve Jones is presiding over the case. 
Jones has already denied the request of former Trump aide Mark Meadows to move his case to federal court. Meadows is currently appealing the decision in the 11th Circuit. The Texas Senate voted Saturday to acquit Attorney General Ken Paxton on all 16 articles of impeachment. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the verdict. I understand you have a motion. The acquittal was resounding, with only two Republicans voting to impeach Paxton, also a Republican, at any point. Paxton was officially reinstated as Attorney General following the vote. This judgment will be filed with the Secretary of State and Attorney General Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. is hereby at this moment reinstated to office. After acquitting Paxton, the Senate voted to dismiss four other articles of impeachment that were brought by the House but not considered during the Senate trial. Paxton was largely absent for the duration of the two-week trial. He appeared on the trial's first day, where he entered a not guilty plea, and again on Friday, when the trial ended. Most of the 16 articles stem from allegations that he abused his office to benefit a wealthy donor. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick presided over the trial. He thanked the senators for what he called doing their work. You all were thorough. You were thoughtful. You were professional. And admonished the Texas House for the manner in which it brought the articles of impeachment. The speaker and his team rammed through the first impeachment of a statewide official in Texas in over 100 years while paying no attention to the precedent that the House set in every other impeachment before. One of Paxton's defense lawyers, Mitch Little, reacted to the verdict. This is good, and now it's over. And Ken Paxton is the attorney general of the state of Texas. Former President Donald Trump also reacted on Truth Social, saying, Congratulations to Attorney General Ken Paxton on a great and historic Texas-sized victory. Paxton issued a statement on the verdict which read, Today the truth prevailed. The truth could not be buried by mud-slinging politicians or their powerful benefactors. Paxton is not entirely out of the woods yet. He still faces a state trial on securities fraud and is under investigation by the FBI. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And for the decision to acquit Paxton could have some political fallout for those who brought the articles of impeachment. House Speaker Date Phelan now faces calls for his resignation from multiple House members who originally voted against impeaching the Attorney General. Trump also called on Phelan to resign, calling the impeachment trial political persecution. The former president added that elected officials should be chosen by voting, not what he called weaponizing government. And we want to get more on the acquittal. We're bringing in Raven Harrison, a political strategist and former congressional candidate. Good morning, Raven. It's good to have you. Now, what do you think Paxton's next move is going to be? Some say he's emboldened now to run for higher office. What do you think? I don't think a higher office. I think right now he should celebrate his win and continue to do what the people of Texas elected him to do. 4.2 million people elected him to to go after the corruption uh, of the Biden administration. And he's been very successful against this administration of winning various lawsuits. So we are happy to have him back to work. I see. Now, um, this impeachment, what does what do you think it says about the Republican Party? It brought out some divide, right? So how is this divide going to impact the GOP in Texas? It highlighted the fracture I've been saying all along. We definitely have some fracturing in the Republican Party, uh, a lot of infighting. And that's what you saw here. And I agree with President Trump. This was a weaponization of the government uh, when you tried to take the decision out of the hands of Texas voters and put it into 30 uh, senators, 12 of which uh, Democrat senators had gone on record of saying that they were going to acquit him without even having heard a shrap of evidence. So that's what you're starting to see here is 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 things coming to a head as we start to move into 24. Well, and with that, are you worried at all that this would make the Republican Party vulnerable in, in any way? I think what it's going to do is it's going to force accountability. There needs to be some deep house cleaning in the party. There needs to be some accountability. We need to find out why this was rammed through. This uh, impeachment was sent through, and I watched it cover to cover. I saw a lot of credible witnesses, law enforcement. What I didn't see was evidence. I didn't see what the compelling evidence was that would lead them to remove a man from his position and basically destroy his life. And that is a dangerous precedent that we cannot have in a free America. Mm. 
Now, the acquittal doesn't seem like it's the end because uh, Paxson has been under investigation for felony fraud as well. What do you think is still to come for him there? Well, I think that there's going to be an interesting light shed on this FBI case. They've had this case for years against Ken Paxson and, and chosen not to move forward with it. It has really gone nowhere. We will see now that this has become a, a highlight issue if they actually proceed with something. But it doesn't seem if they've been sitting on these on this case for a while that there would be any urgency to proceed with it now. Mm. Now, d before we go here, obviously there is a different opinion, differing in opinions about this, but what for you do you think was the reason for the impeachment? I think it was a it was a, an attempt to weaponize. I think it was to a shot at Trump for one to try to destabilize Texas. Ken Paxson has been a strong uh, supporter of President Trump. We're going into an election year. There's been a lot of of friction between Ken Paxton and the Biden administration. And I believe it is definitely a power grab that you wanted to say, OK, instead of let's letting the voters decide who they want to be governed, who they want to be attorney general, we're going to let 30 uh, politicized uh, members of elected office decide. And that was a dangerous precedent. I think that was the driving factor behind all of this. Mm, I see. Well, thank you so much for your insights, Raven Harrison. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Next up, a live interview with some campaign analysis. We'll look at how an impeachment would affect Biden's campaign and Trump's recent interview with Meet the Press, so stay tuned. Anyone who's ever sold a home can tell you it is really hard. That's why who you work with matters. Together with Homelight, we've helped thousands of people sell faster and for the best price. You're not gonna get it all right. Just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at mhtsa.gov slash the right seat. We would like to help you maintain a healthy body and mind so that you have the strength to enjoy a productive and fulfilling life. We want to keep you informed so that you can make the best decisions to support your family. We want to offer you the best education so you can join us in building a positive future for humanity. We hope to inspire you with goodness and compassion, to nurture your heart and soul with love and kindness, and fill your spirit with positive things. We'd like to share the tastiest meals with you because you are part of our family. We want to bring you the most interesting and exciting things so we can enjoy every single day together. Ganjing World, technology for humanity. I use Book a Limo on all my trips. They have drivers everywhere. I always feel safe when I travel with their chauffeurs, from hello to goodbye. Checking rates, booking, and managing clients' reservations online is so easy. The confirmations, trip reminders, and car status updates are great when I'm on the go. I want my clients to have the best experience during their trip. That's why I've used Book a Limo for the past 30 years. What's your destination? Book a Limo, any car, anywhere. It's good to have you back with us. Now we're bringing in a political analyst to talk about how an impeachment of President Biden would affect the 2024 race, considering his likely challenger Trump has been impeached and acquitted twice. Joining us live is Lenny McAllister, a senior fellow with the Commonwealth Foundation. Good morning, Lenny. It's always great to see you. Good morning, likewise. So there is a realistic possibility that Biden will be impeached. Now, the odds of him being convicted in the Senate are slim as it stands right now. But how would an impeachment affect Biden's campaign? I don't know if it would affect it that much at all. It's the same way impeachment twice has not impacted Donald Trump's poll numbers with his most ardent voters. You have to remember that the people that are for President Biden, more than being for Joe Biden, they're against Donald Trump. And they still see an incumbent president that's seen as a moderate Democrat as being the best choice to go up against Donald Trump in 2024. So if you end up having an indictment of President Biden, you're going to probably see the same dynamic on the left that you saw with Donald Trump 
on the right, that the indictments are going to be seen as as a, a scar of martyrdom that's going to be used to raise money and coalesce a base to say we have to win in 2024 against the other side. And now you're just going to have two major political parties using these indictments as scars and battle wounds to bolster the case against the other side moving through the next 16 months. Right. We've seen tens and tens of millions of people vote for Trump, even following these impeachments. And of course, we've seen ardent voters, like you said, just still strong in the polls for Trump, despite the indictments. Can you compare and contrast Biden's brewing impeachment with Trump's first? I think the difference really is with the, the Trump indictment, the first indictment in particular. Both of those indictments are a little bit more political. The one that came after January 6th, there was tangible evidence in a scared nation during the pandemic. And so there's a little bit of a different tone to that second indictment. But the first one was one where people said, ah, why are we doing this? It's a bridge too far. And one of the things that the American people forget is the fact that the Democrats were obsessed with indicting Donald Trump in 2019 going into 2020. At the same exact time, the COVID virus was taking over China, and we should have been more on alert. And people blame the White House for not doing that, but people forget that the Democrats were more concerned about indicting President Trump going into the 2020 election than they were about dealing with COVID. You had Nancy Pelosi, you had Bill de Blasio telling people to go out for Chinese New Year and focusing on that and the indictment, not on this weird new virus coming over from China that we weren't getting a lot of information about. So I think people will look at the, the first indictment of Trump and the Biden indictment and impeachment process, the, not indictment, impeachment process, the same exact way. It's highly political and they're gonna eschew it as much as they possibly can. An interesting fact here is that both of these, the would-be impeachment and Trump's first impeachment, were both over Ukraine. Of course, Trump's involving this alleged pro quo to have Zelensky investigate Biden and now Biden being allegedly involved with Hunter's business dealings in the foreign country. So I want to know, what did you think of Trump's interview with Pete, Meet the Press? It was typical Trump. I mean, the bottom line is Donald Trump has a narrative. He has to continue to bolster, he has to continue to advance. And look, it works for him, it creates protections for him, and on top of that, he can fundraise and coalesce the base. He can use the type of rhetoric he's been doing now for almost 10 years to beat down his opponents and bring his allies together. And the other thing it does as well is it forces his opponents in this primary to be on the defense, just the same way they were in 2016. People are more afraid of making him and his base angry, more his base than him, than they are about telling the truth or standing up and taking a cause. You see that DeSantis is trying to do that now, but every time he does that, Trump gets another platform, he says another thing, and there's a consequence that DeSantis has to deal with subsequent. He's always on the defense. He's not, enough to, he's not doing enough to be on the offense and cut down those poll numbers and make it a competitive race. Right, and Trump didn't rule out the possibility of him pardoning himself if he does win yeah. re-election. Let's talk about the underdog, RFK Jr. Thankfully, they, are, they apprehended the man that was impersonating a U.S. Marshal who was armed at his rally. But what did you think of his comments in Los Angeles? I think RFK is building a narrative of there's a viable second option in the Democratic Party, even though he is a lot more moderate than even Joe Biden is at this point in time. Biden was a moderate then it had to acquiesce to the far left once he got into the White House, particularly during the pandemic. I think RFK is trying to find a way to at least have that contrast between Biden and himself. And furthermore, I think that Republicans want to see RFK Jr. be able to show that contrast between Biden and himself. You know, he is the, the fly in the ointment that the Democratic Party really wishes would go away because not only is he basically competing against an incumbent president, which you never want. Ask Jimmy Carter about that with Ted Kennedy, um, RFK's uncle. But on top of that, he is saying things that many in the right wing base agree with. So this is something that could split a vote, that can cause a controversy. And if it ended up happening on a debate stage between RFK Jr. and Biden, it's enough to trip Biden up. The one thing, if we remember in 2019, Joe Biden, then the former vice president, didn't do well in any of the debates. The last thing they want is another contrast to remind people of how bad he did four years ago, much less now. Well, I really appreciate your analysis on this. Lenny McAllister with the Commonwealth Foundation, thank you. Thank you, God bless.
A group of House Republicans announced a deal yesterday to provide temporary funding for the government. Members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus and the more moderate Main Street Caucus came to terms on a short-term stopgap bill to keep the government open until the end of October. The deal includes a spending cut of more than 8 percent on agencies, apart from the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. The measure also includes restrictions on immigration and the U.S. border with Mexico. It does not include funding for Ukraine, which Biden requested. It's unclear if the measure has enough to support to pass the chamber. The spending cuts were also likely to draw opposition from Democrats in the House and Senate who reject the immigration provisions. And casual Friday every day, <laughs> that's how things are shaping up for the U.S. Senate. It's axing its dress code for elected members. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer sent the Senate Sergeant at Arms the directive. One lawmaker who will definitely benefit from the policy change is Democrat Senator John Fetterman. He can now keep his trademark hooded sweatshirts and gym shorts while at work. Fetterman previously had to employ a workaround to wear his preferred attire, voting from a doorway rather than the Senate floor. The easing of rules, however, doesn't apply to visitors. They'll have to keep those coats and ties on if they're men and business attire if they're women. Just ahead, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan meets secretly with China's top diplomat over the weekend. And a flurry of military activity around Taiwan follows the visit. Get more after the break. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perillocene, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritang Omega-3 does not smell fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritang Green Vegetable Omega-3. Greener, healthier, and more effective. Visit puritang.com to learn more. Stay tuned to get two rolls of Alien Tape free. You wouldn't stick your mother-in-law on the wall, but you could. With Alien Tape, it just sticks. Just peel and stick to make anything stay in place quick. Brick, pavers, marble, tile, plastic, even leather. Nothing works better than Alien Tape. You wouldn't stick your fishbowl on a moving car, but you could with Alien Tape. The secret is nano stick technology that grabs and locks on to secure one side of the surface to the other. Alien Tape secures in seconds, then twist, pull, and rinse to reuse. Call or go online to get your first roll of Alien Tape for just $19.99, plus shipping and processing. But to make this deal really stick, we'll give you two more rolls absolutely free. You get three rolls of Alien Tape for one low price. Order now. To order, call 1-800-490-1364 or go to tryaliantape.com. So call 1-800-490-1364 or order online at tryaliantape.com. Welcome back. Five Americans imprisoned in Iran are expected to be released today as part of a wider U.S.-Iran deal. That's according to the Iranian Foreign Ministry spokesman. The U.S. government says all five Americans as being wrongfully detained. A jet is on standby in Iran to bring the five Americans to Doha, the capital of Qatar. They should then fly to the United States. The agreement also involves the release of five Iranians in U.S. custody. Under the deal, $6 billion in Iranian funds held in restricted accounts in South Korea would be transferred to restricted accounts in banks in Qatar. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with China's top diplomat Wang Yi in Malta over the weekend. The White House says talks were candid, substantive and constructive. Some issues discussed were global and regional security, the war in Ukraine and Taiwan. 
Sullivan reportedly noted the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait during the meetings. Taiwan's defense ministry said today that it detected 103 Chinese aircraft and nine warships around the island after the visit. It called the number a recent high. A Biden administration official says talks showed limited early signs that military communications between the two countries could start to be restored. The White House suggested more meetings between the U.S. and China will come over the next few months. And North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un has completed his trip to Russia during his week-long visit Kim pledged to step up military and economic cooperation with President Vladimir Putin, raising concerns from South Korea and the U.S. Entities Cost Jimenez has more on Kim's visit. Kim Jong-un left the railway station in Russia's far eastern city of Artyom on Sunday. On his visit, Kim discussed a potential arms deal with President Vladimir Putin, though no official agreement has yet been signed. According to North Korea's state media, the visit aimed to further solidify cooperation between the two countries. Upon his departure, a Russian official gave Kim several military gifts, including five explosive kamikaze drones, a reconnaissance drone and a bulletproof vest. During his trip, Kim visited multiple military, educational as well as cultural facilities, including a Russian fighter jet factory that is under Western sanctions. Meanwhile, South Korea and the United States warned against any weapons trade and other military cooperation between Russia and North Korea. In light of Russia's continued invasion of Ukraine, as well as North Korea's nuclear programs, it was Kim's first official overseas trip since the COVID pandemic. Kost Hemenes, NTD News. And now let's head to Malcolm Hudson in the UK for some short headlines from around the world. Good morning from the UK, Evelyn and Kevin. The European Commission is at odds with Poland, Hungary and Slovakia over banning grain imports from Ukraine. Brussels opted not to renew the ban last week. But Poland, Hungary and Slovakia fear the impact on their farmers. They've gone against the decision and declared they will continue the ban. The Australian government wants dating apps to boost safety for its users. They've been given till the end of June next year to come up with a voluntary code of practice. The communications minister warns the government will take regulatory and legislative measures if the code is not delivered. China's top diplomat is visiting Moscow for security talks. During his four-day trip, Wang Yi is expected to prepare a possible landmark visit by President Vladimir Putin to Beijing in October. The Moscow visit comes after meeting President Joe Biden's national security adviser over the weekend in Malta. Dozens of people, including at least 26 police officers, were injured during unrest in Stuttgart, Germany. It took place over the weekend during a cultural festival of the African nation Eritrea. Around 200 protesters threw stones, bottles and other items at police officers and those participating in the event. It's the latest in a string of clashes surrounding Eritrean cultural events in Germany and elsewhere. Climate protesters sprayed orange paint up the columns of Berlin's landmark Brandenburg Gate. The group, Last Generation, said the action was to protest a lack of government action on moving away from fossil fuels. Berlin's mayor condemned the group's action, saying their tactics go beyond legitimate forms of protest. That's all from me. Back to you both. Yeah, it looks like there needs to be some repercussions there for the actions of those protesters. Oh, yeah. You mean the spray painting? for yeah. the Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's just, that's that, like you said, that's beyond the range of peaceful protest. Mm, that's right. So we're going to go into a break now. California Governor Gavin Newsom has said he will sign a controversial climate bill. The move comes just after California sued several major oil companies. And 10 GOP presidential hopefuls make their case and I to Iowa voters. How did their messages land in the key caucus state? That story coming up after the break.
One in five children worldwide are faced with the reality of living without food. No family dinners, no special treats, no full bellies. All around the world, parents are struggling to feed their children. Toddlers are suffering from acute malnutrition, which stunts their growth. Kids are forced to drop out of school so they can help support their families. COVID, conflict, inflation, and climate have ignited the worst famine in our lifetime. And we are fed up. Fed up with the fact that hunger robs children of their childhood. Fed up with the lack of progress. Fed up with the injustice. Help us brighten the lives of children all over the world by visiting getfedupnow.org. For as little as $10 a month, you can join Save the Children as we support children and families in desperate need of our help. Now is the time to get fed up and give back. When you join the cause, your $10 monthly donation can help communities in need of life-saving treatments and nutrients, prevent children from dropping out of school, support our work with communities and governments to help children go from short-term surviving to long-term thriving. And now, thanks to special government grants, every dollar you give before December 31st can multiply up to 10 times the impact. That means more food, water, medicine, and help for kids around the world. You'll also receive a free tote bag to share your support for children in need. Childhood without food is unimaginable. Get fed up. Call us now or visit getfedupnow.org today. Welcome back. Over the weekend in Iowa, for many Republican presidential candidates, their first big appearance since the primary debate a few weeks ago, and their last big chance to show themselves side by side in person to Iowa residents. The state has a significant role in hosting the Republican Party's first in the nation caucuses on January 15th. And today's Stephanie Cox was in Iowa. First, put on the full armor of God. Then you can be an effective leader when you do that. So Christ has been everything to me. Well, somebody say praise the Lord. Speaking to evangelical Christians at Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition's presidential town hall, 10 Republican candidates offering their stance on protecting life in the womb. You'll have a champion for life in the Oval Office. If our members of Congress can reach a consensus and pass a pro-life bill that has reasonable exceptions to it that we all agree upon, I will sign that as a pro-life president. I personally believe uh, that uh, life begins at conception. Uh, I do not, however, believe that it is an issue that the federal government should take over. I'm going to do what I think is right. Let, um, you know, we've got to understand that, that, that these mothers need our support. Uh, they need our comfort, and we need to have government and organizations working, especially in this environment. A lot of times the abortion is driven by financial considerations. A lot of these women have no support. Can't we all agree that we should encourage adoptions and good quality adoptions? Can't we all agree that doctors and nurses who don't believe in abortion shouldn't have to perform them? And can't we all agree that no woman that has an abortion should get a prison sentence or the death penalty. Let's start there. And on parents' rights and school choice. Let's take a look at the idea of education. Shouldn't the parents have a right to choose where the kids go to school and what they learn? Let's get rid of the Department of Education. Throw it out. We do that because it's corrupting our kids. I will stand in the fire and make sure that kids growing up in poverty, kids growing up in rural America, have the quality education as a choice. Many citing energy independence and reigning in spending as a way to balance the books. They spoke of building the wall and enforcing law at the border and on foreign policy. Our relationship with Israel will be stronger by the end of my first term than it ever has been because we will treat it as a true friendship, not just a transactional tit-for-tat relationship. I think it's absolutely in the national interest of the United States of America to give the Ukrainian military what they need to defeat and repel the Russian invasion so Russia doesn't cross a border that we have to go fight them someday soon. I believe that's, that's the way we prevent World War III. 
And back home on protecting religious freedom. It's a threat to re religious liberty. It is a threat to liberty of every kind in this country. Make sure that everything from State Department to DOJ is in line in protecting these kinds of, of religious freedoms. At the end of the day, how are these messages landing with Iowans? I just love the energy that all of them brought. Um, I loved that uh, there was a consistent theme of faith is important, family is important, securing our borders is important, balancing the budget is important. Um, there's so many issues on the table and I appreciated that all of them were willing to address them. I'm undecided, and uh, but my favorite part about being in Iowa and First of the Nation is having this chance to get this close, interact with them, shake hands, maybe ask them those more direct questions and see what they say. They really put a lot of effort in here. Most of them are going to every, each 99 county, right? And for all of us to feel like we have a seat at the table, that we can make a difference, that's really exciting. An excitement that's expected to grow as January 15th draws nearer. And while the GOP's front runner missed the event, former President Trump will be making his own campaign stops in Iowa in just a couple of days, and we'll keep you updated on that. In Des Moines, Iowa, I'm Stephanie Cox, NTD News. And the next presidential debate is scheduled for September 27th in California. Meanwhile, you can watch Saturday's full town hall event on our website, as well as individual interviews with some of the candidates at NTD.com. And now we're going to bring you some short news alerts. The military is searching for the wreckage of an F-35 fighter jet that crashed yesterday near Charleston, South Carolina. The pilot ejected safely and is in stable condition. The cause of the crash is still unknown. Locals were asked to help if they spot the wreckage. Two pilots were killed yesterday in Reno during the national championship air races. Two planes collided mid-air during the finals of the championship. The National Transportation Safety Board and the FAA are investigating the crash. No spectators were injured. An L.A. County sheriff was shot in an ambush while sitting in his cruiser. He was found unconscious in his vehicle but later died of his injuries. Video shows a car pulling up next to the sheriff. A $250,000 reward is being offered for information on the shooter. The owner of a New York City daycare and a neighbor have been charged in connection with the death of a one-year-old after possible exposure to fentanyl. One other child remains in critical condition and two others are currently in stable condition. California Governor Gavin Newsom said yesterday he would sign legislation pertaining to emissions disclosure. The bill would require large companies to disclose what it calls greenhouse gas emissions. The bill requires companies in California with a turnover of at least $1 billion per year to disclose what it calls their Scope 1, 2, and 3 emissions. Newsom also said he would sign a related bill that would force large corporations to disclose what it calls their climate-related financial risks. The bill is expected to apply to nearly 5,500 companies. Multinational companies, including Apple and Microsoft, have voiced support for the bill, which some lawmakers say could still be challenged in court. The move comes shortly after the state sued several major oil companies, including ExxonMobil Exxon and Chevron. According to a court filing, the companies are accused of playing down risks posed by fossil fuels and causing tens of billions of dollars in damages, as well as deceiving the public. And tens of thousands of demonstrators flooded the streets of Midtown Manhattan yesterday, demanding an end to what they call environmental injustice. An estimated 75,000 people took part in the protest. The mass demonstration is part of a global wave focused on ending what it calls the era of fossil fuel reliance. It's a lot of people. That is. Well, and moving on, rural mothers are facing a growing problem amid the increasing closures of rural birthing centers. The closures have worsened so-called maternity care deserts, counties with no hospitals or birth centers that offer obstetric, ob obstetric care. There's a growing crisis for U.S. mothers living in rural areas. Less than half of rural hospitals have maternity units where obstetric care is provided. Roughly 2 million mothers of childbearing age are affected by the shortage. 
One study showed rural residents have a 9% greater chance of life-threatening complications or death from pregnancy and birth compared to those in urban areas, and having less access to care plays a part. We don't have a birthing center here in Baker City. It closed down on August 26th, um, and my due date is September 28th, um, with an induction probably the 21st, but um, we don't feel safe being so far away from a birthing center. And if you don't have somewhere where you can check and make sure things are okay, it's just really scary. One solution to the problem may be following the European model of using more midwives in the delivery process. So a more uh, wise and effective way to kind of triage people is midwives do all the normal and obstetricians do the high risk. And that's how it is in a lot of European countries. And then you're getting the appropriate level of care for what their risk is. Well, again, they're high quality, low cost. So in terms of cost, that's a huge savings. We spend more on maternity care in this country than any other place, and we don't have outcomes to show that that is a good thing. It seems that the current problem may lead to solutions that actually improve the birthing situation for rural mothers. The Yale School of Medicine reports that midwifery improves birth outcomes in many different areas, including lower mortality rates of mothers and newborns. Hopefully they can get them the resources they need because that is such an important time mm, and exactly, very yeah. sensitive. I mean, it sounds like a midwifery might be a good solution for that because it sounds really scary not being able to access the care that you need, especially becoming a new mother, maybe even your first child. What are you going to do? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and we're going to head to break now. Day four of the United Auto Workers strikes. President Sean Fain says chaos is in his strategy after rejecting an offer. How serious could the strikes be? NTD Business host Don Ma has the latest. And an announcement by actress Drew Barrymore. Her talk show won't be returning following criticism from fellow actors and writers. That and more after the break. Barsha luck up criminals, not your back. Don't get the shakedown from lesser spine surgeons who utilize screws, rods, and disc replacements. At Benati, no hardware is ever used. 65% of patients come to us after receiving failed back and neck surgery at other facilities. With 98.75% patient reported satisfaction, you don't have to be a prisoner to your pain. Benati succeeds where others fail. Visit askbenati.com. It's all is good, it, baby. Is it really all good? If you love me enough to routinely test your handyman skills, not to mention the strength of your marriage, then of course you'll visit nhtsa.gov slash the right seat to make sure I'm in the right car seat. Good to have you back. The UAW strike continues after the union rejected the latest offer from big three carmaker Stellantis. The rejected offer would have provided workers with a 21% pay raise. And as the United Auto Workers Union strike enters its fourth day, what is Union President Sean Fain's plan? Here to discuss this is Entity Business host Don Ma. Good morning, Don. Great to have you. Yeah, good morning, Kevin. How are you doing this morning? Doing good, and I hope you are too. What is yep. Sean Fain's strategy here, Don, to start? Yeah, great question, Kevin. There's actually many aspects to, the, to his plan, but I think one at the center is chaos. He, he outlined a strategy to create confusion with a series of work stoppages targeting uh, individual U.S. plants. And this, this plan of confusion, I think that's actually exemplified in the time of actually when the union announced which plants will be struck. Uh, they, they announced it quite late on Thursday night, as we all remember. And, and this is to keep the automakers on their toes and to, to keep them guessing. Now, the, the, UA, the UAW is striking three plants. Um, these plants are not crucial to the automakers' operations as of right now. But the option to increase uh, the size and scope of the strike is still on the table, Kevin. He could order more workers off the job at plants uh, that could be 
more disruptive to uh, automakers' operations. You know, though, that's including plants uh, like transmission or engine factories. You know, which of course supply crucial parts uh, to to plants around the country. Yeah, there's some tough decisions the automakers have to make here. So, what's the scope of the impact Sean Fain can have on the auto industry in the U.S.? Well, Kevin, to put it bluntly, uh, he could actually do a lot to the auto in- industry because you know, slowing or stopping the production of a few engine or transmission plants at each automaker could be you know as effective as stopping operations as as a full strike at all plants. So one engine or transmission location per company might be enough to shut down uh, nearly three quarters of the U.S. assembly plants. And, and on top of that, if he strikes two plants per company, that can pretty much you know idle North America. This is according to industry experts, Kevin. Idle North America, yeah, no pun intended there. And yeah, there's a supply chain, there's, you know, there's a critical path that needs to happen, so there could be ripple effects. So what else do you have for us, Don? Sure, just a few more updates. Uh, one of the immediate, uh, immediate impacts of the auto workers' strike is layoffs, uh, because two of the three big car makers announced that 2,600 union workers will be let go. Ford says uh, 600 employees at Michigan's sub-assembly and stamping plant were told not to report to work. And this is because they rely on the final assembly and paint departments, which are on strike. GM said about 2,000 employees in Kansas City will be laid off because the plant depends on parts from a Missouri plant, which is also on strike. Uh, The union criticized the layoffs, of of course, and threatened to expand the strike to additional plants. Uh, But other than that, uh, in the housing market, uh, mortgage applications dropped to their lowest point in nearly 30 years, uh, while monthly mortgage payments hit an all-time high. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates 11 times in 18 months, trying to cool inflation, of course, uh, causing the increase in mortgage payments. Uh, Spiking home prices due to a lack of existing housing have pushed uh, buyers out of the market and caused housing demands to hit hit near record lows. And besides these two updates, that's all from me, Kevin. Hopefully in the near future, more Americans can get back into the housing market because that's a big asset. And they say, you know, never sell your first home. So Don Ma, host of NTD Business, great talking with you. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Kevin. Thank you so much. Actress Drew Barrymore is putting her talk show on pause pending the end of the Hollywood actor's strike. She made the announcement on social media yesterday following backlash on her last week's decision to resume production. The Drew Barrymore show was set to return today but drew criticism from fellow actors as well as the Writers Guild of America who've been on strike since May. The producers of the show CBS Media Ventures issued a statement yesterday affirming support for Barrymore's decision. The strike action has caused several other talk shows to be paused including The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Another TV show on CBS, The Talk, also says it will pause production following Barrymore's announcement. Other talk show hosts, including Bill Mayer, also received criticism for announcing a return to television. The writer's strikes are aimed at negotiating better pay, as well as eliminating concerns regarding the use of AI. And coming up, we have more for you. Firefighters need to be in the zone to get get fires under control. And members of the FDNY are tough, really tough. But their mental firewall is being breached as all the stress from the job combined with that stemming from the pandemic is just too much. A director of a support group tells NTD how you can help these brave men and women in just a minute. Hi everyone watching at home. We're here to remind you that if you or someone you know were injured in an accident that was not your fault, listen up. We have live agents available right now to answer your questions and tell you how much your case is potentially worth. Hi, I'm Gina Bellet here with spokesman and TV personality Tom Mustin with us in the Help Center. So Tom, phones are really busy over there. Tell us what kind of calls you're seeing. Well, Gina, first off, thank you for having me here in the call center with you. We always enjoy talking to the viewers and getting folks the compensation that they deserve. You know, we're seeing calls about all kinds of accidents, but the most common by far has been car accidents. So if you or someone you know were injured in an accident that was not your fault, give us a call right now. You'll speak with a live person. They'll answer any questions you have and tell you if you have a case and how much your case is potentially worth. 
Thanks, Tom. All right, folks at home, you heard it. Take advantage of this opportunity and call now. I use Book a Limo on all my trips. They have drivers everywhere. I always feel safe when I travel with their chauffeurs, from hello to goodbye. Checking rates, booking, and managing clients' reservations online is so easy. The confirmations, trip reminders, and car status updates are great when I'm on the go. I want my clients to have the best experience during their trip. That's why I've used Book a Limo for the past 30 years. What's your destination? Book a Limo, any car, anywhere. My name's Jim Marshall. I've been playing professional football in the Women's League for three years now. We're about three and a half weeks out of my second surgery now. I had no pain whatsoever, no tingling, no numbness, and I felt incredible. I'm able to do pretty much anything. He doesn't want me pushing it too much, but I'm able to do, you know, assisted pull-ups now. I'm riding a bike. I'm walking continuously at an incline on treadmills. I can do push-ups again. I can get out of bed, no problem. You're in great hands. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Welcome back. The mental well-being of New York City firefighters is under threat. Yes, it is serious. A daunting job combined with pressures stemming from the pandemic are pushing some of these extremely tough and resilient first responders to the brink. But there's a glimmer of hope that has been invaluable to helping them cope. I investigated in New York City. Take a look. A record number of FDNY firefighters and their families are seeking mental health counseling. A nonprofit that provides mental health services to active and retired members called Friends of Firefighters says they have recorded over the last two years a 35% increase in the number of counseling sessions with more people seeking out help now than they've ever seen. We're joined now by Nancy Carbone, the executive director of Friends of Firefighters. Nancy, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you for having me. Why is it that so many of New York's bravest are seeking out mental health counseling right now? I think that there's a backlog of people that may have thought about counseling prior to the pandemic, but I think the pandemic is really what put it over the top. Uh, these are essential workers who were working all during the pandemic. Their children were not in school. And uh, that's a tremendous pressure for everyone. But I think being first responders and continuously exposed to the pandemic, to the uh, virus, but also communities as a whole, uh, you know, New York City was hit very, very hard. And I think that it really impacted uh, the families, certainly, but our first responders as well. Yes, the city was under lockdown, and that could be stressful for everyone, let alone people who risk their lives going into burning buildings with noxious fumes, carrying heavy equipment. So tell us more about your efforts during and after the pandemic. Well, during the pandemic, you know, we, we had to have a, an approach that would protect our staff, but also the members of the department. So we were doing drop-offs to the houses, uh, different materials. Uh, in the beginning, they had trouble getting masks themselves, so we were securing them from outside sources and giving those to the houses, along with sanit uh, you know, the sanitary uh, hand wash and all of that. Um, primarily, though, um, we really were making it known that we were available for them to talk to. So prior to the pandemic, we switched over to, well, we didn't switch over, but we added a, um, an online presence, primarily for the firefighters that are not in this area and could not drop in. So going into 2020, we had eight locations throughout the city in Long Island. We now have the one. Um, and the reason being is during that time, and I didn't know how long it would be, uh, we were not going to maintain all of those locations. So we stayed at the one location, which is the one we're in. It's an 1871 uh, firehouse that was, uh, a new one was built up the street. So it's not decommissioned, but it's not active. Um, after the pandemic, it became very clear very quickly that our numbers were starting to uptick. And uh, at this point, it's 221% increase since 2020. So have you seen any measurable results on how you're able to improve their mental health? Yeah, you know, that's a wonderful thing is when you start to see them. Now, I'm in the position where I see people coming and going unless they're still the people that are online doing their counseling. And I see them physically changing. I see them lightening up. But the counselors themselves are seeing progress across the board. As long as people have a place to go where they can be heard and understood and perhaps get some uh, help on how to navigate which is a very uncertain time. A member of the community shared his thoughts on the importance of firefighters and keeping them mentally healthy. Oh, very important, very important. Their mental is everything, because when they're going in trying to save lives, they, they, need, they need to be mentally ready to uh, perform their duties daily. 
And how important do you think it is for the city to provide them the resources they need? Uh, very important, very important, because they, 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 they are very important to the city itself. Fires in New York City, they're not like regular fires, like regular house fires. You have a fire here, you, it, you see how the buildings connect? It can easily spread, so we need as much firefighters as possible. Carbone says there is a way for the community to help, and that is to support organizations like hers with donations. One way to do that is buying tickets to their fundraiser in October. And you can help them achieve their goal of raising $200,000 by attending their 16th annual gala on October 19th at Pioneer Works at 159 Pioneer Street in Brooklyn. What a great way to spend your time to help the community. And you know, Evelyn, back in the day, because well, they said they had one of the, their family members as a Bronx fire captain, right. they would go into buildings without a mask. And they said if you wore a mask, you were a wuss. Wow. I, well, what to say about that? I'm just glad they know better now. <laughs> but <laughs> <Yeah>. that's rough. <laughs> yeah, they have to wear masks now. Otherwise, you get written up. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's also quite negligent, I would say. But all, all right, um, that's all for today's program. We'd love to hear for you, from you at goodmorning at ntd.com. So write us an email if you'd like. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.